Can you tell me, I'm going to caption this, but can you tell me your name and where we are? Okay, my name is Yuri Neyman and we are in the office of Global Cinematography Institute. Okay, well, seeing as you've, seeing as you've mentioned it, I think we should start right there. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I want to talk to you, where you about where you've come from and how you've got here, and how your thinking is what it is, but let's start with the thinking. So the Global Cinematography, Cinematography Institute, where, where did that idea come from? And what is that idea? Okay, the idea is to have educational facility institution for advanced cinematography to prepare cinematographers to new age in cinematography, what we call expanded cinematography, when cinematography we would be able, and able a little bit now, to expand its influence on all artistic and technical aspects of modern cinematography, which involved in it, not only live cinematography, as we associate with this more often, but also with uh, virtual cin cinematography, cinematography involved special effects, cinematography involved even video game, in all aspects which uh, affects imagery. A long time ago, cinematography and imagery was synonymous, the same. Now it's not, due to many, many factors which is too numerous to list it now, uh, cinematography and imagery became not necessarily the same because uh, films now done by huge teams uh, of the people who involved in imagery but they're not cinematographers. And uh, observing scene and uh, been practicing cinematographers for a long time and also been involved in theory and practice of cinematography, also been teacher, I kind of envisioned that uh, we need to teach cinematographers new skills to be able to influence visual and visual decisions in all parts of production of the film. When did this idea start to, uh, how, how long a period has it taken for the idea to begin to, to expand into this, this overall vision? Uh, it started from uh, when I uh, get offered to create a first class, I believe, in the United States at least, maybe, uh, History of Cinematography for AFI Film School. It was like 2007, 2006, and some school this time, 2007, I believe. So I've been offered to create, uh, we were talking about the necessity for students to know history. Like any artist knows history, everybody knows history of craft or art. And, um, and uh, I create like short history of cinematography for people to understand what they're doing and just a lot of people thinking that everything was done when they've been born, is not. <laughs> And uh, ju just to show where is today's cinematography is, how it can benefit for learning what's happened before, because everything going in cycles, obviously. Like so you must have been thinking about this before you did this this particular lecture or this particular course, yeah? Well, a, a lot of thinking even in, in my film school in in Moscow, because uh, as a per one of the requirements to be graduated from Moscow Film School, you have to write an essay about theory of cinematography. So my essay was uh, like uh, understanding of style in cinematography. And I was planned to continue to as work in cinematography, obviously, and I did. Uh, but also, and I had a very good teacher in aesthetics who influenced me a lot, with whom I still in touch. It was very interesting. Obviously, when you came in, I came in the United States, this became a really, really back seat. <laughs> I have to start to work as a cinematographer to restart, recharge my career again and move forward. And the issue of theories and education went on, on the back of my head. But uh, little by little, I started to get move forward. And when I created for AFI history of cinematography concept in class, I start to uh, kind of end observing what's happened in cinematography because in 1994, I did an invention. Again, I didn't plan to make an invention. I did an invention uh, for myself. I didn't even call it an invention. I created like a chart for Telecine. When Telecine appears, it was all cinematographers uh, lost control over the images. 
um, have the degree of kind of photographic science. So for me, it was not so difficult, honestly, to figure out how to do it. But I came to this idea to Kodak in 94. And they said, no, it's telecine will go away. They told me, quote unquote. It was very funny. So basic, it was very funny to hear from them, from their scientists. What guys, come on. Have you ever been on a set? Or anyway, so and so it became uh, birth of my company, Gamma Density. So based on this and the practice of cinematography, having a company Gamma Density, I, I met tremendous. I had unbelievable experience to meeting a lot of people whom you usually do not meet as cinematographer. Cinematographers are rarely meeting meeting each other. They are not extremely professional friendly. No, you have personal friends, but usually it's kind of. Very limited. Edgy. Edgy. Yes, that's, <laughs> I would like to go in this uh, Freudian aspect of this, but anyway, it's edgy. You, you mentioned the losing control. There was, I remember there were meetings going on around uh, Europe and America at one point about this sense of... Uh, there was the old definition of the, de the director of photography, which was almost like the chief quality control person mm -hmm. on the whole shoot from front to back. And then there's this fact, when did we start losing control? What was the reason? Well, um, the reason we start to lose it, okay, I would say in my theory, Star Wars became well short. In Star Wars, a relationship between director, director of photography, special effects, production de design changed for forever. Yeah. It was good cinematographer Gilbert who did a lot of science fiction, but in Star Wars, his role became less significant as usual, mm. cinematographers. And, and it was beginning of the new era. Now we're coming to Avatar, Hugo, and then there's basically on, on this presumption we built our school. But again, what I'm saying, I have to go back. Uh, being um, kind of inventor of control system, which we chart and uh, uh, three speed system in the same room, this office, I met a lot of DPs, which usually you're not meeting. And I start to see how, I start to hear. No, I became familiar with a lot of strange stories, what's happening, yeah. what's happening, and how a lot of decisions been made uh, without even asking, say, in Simatov, which definitely led, leads, and will lead, if we not stop it, to, um, uh, I would say, devaluation of, of profession. And uh, this, that I have very special perch uh, to see on both sides of the fence, from te technological point of view, as an inventor, as a practicing cinematographer, and I start to see what's going on, and start to give me, well, we have to change system of ed 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 education. Then when I started teaching AFI, it became more clear to me, just a way of people teaching, and I've been teaching in the school. I, I, I thought, after Liquid Sky, I thought like in New York uh, University, um, st State University, and I've been teaching seminars, teaching town seminars. So I, I got a lot of information in front of me, which requires action, and action was on, an answer would be on, only one. We need to create a totally different system of education of cinematographers. And little by little, kind of, um, it came to idea it has to be totally new, new system of education. And um, when I spoke with Wilmer Zygmunt, because I obviously I knew Wilmer Zygmunt and uh, I knew seminars, and for um, Gamma Density Journal, I did interview with Zygmunt. He considered like this, yeah, yeah. Zygmunt, yeah. And when I talked to him about it, and we start talking about his days of, in school in Hungary, my days in school in Moscow, because all Eastern European, which is very strong film school programs or curriculums, based mainly on Moscow film school program. It's happened historically and otherwise, because program was created before World War II by like government called Best Cinematographer, said, okay, do it. And Best Cinematographer did, probably best program. And after end of World War II, after like li li liberation of Eastern Europe, and they, all schools, uh, like Polish school, Czech school, Hungarian school, Romanian schools, they, be, they basically accepted the yeah. Soviet system of film education. I don't know what's happened with, with directors or scriptwriters, but I know about cinematographers. They basically have the same system. 
So I spoke with many people, Polish Matrov, and we started to exchange notes with Wilmers, and definitely we talk about how they've been taught, how like in the 50s, how I was taught in the end of the 60s, 70s. Yeah. The same, and we, find, we kind of, it was a good system. It was, you have to uh, learn a lot of things bef before you became a cinematographer. How, how would you characterize the fundamental difference in the way that it was taught before and what your vision is with the Global Cinematography Institute? Uh, we are teaching, uh, basic difference is, basic difference is that we are teaching everything which is related to image creation. Not only by live camera or digital camera, which are basically two. Well, we are teaching pre-visualization. We don't plan to people will become expert, no. But they have to understand what, what conversation is all about and bring their cup of tea for the, for the table. Something to the lunch. If they would not know what people are talking about, they became irrelevant. We're teaching them digital um, lighting. How? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Digital lighting. We're teaching them all aspects of post production on both sides to be able to make qualified decisions. Because yeah. now it was a period when DIT took over. Is this to take power back, not power, but is this to take responsibility back for the, for the cinematographer? Not only responsibility, well, we can say duty, responsibilities, whatever, to, okay, to become back at the helm of the image um, creation. Because in today's pro the process, it is very important, live cinematography, I can, if I have time later, I will show you our presentation. So, live cinematography per, per, per se, it's only, part of a uh, big film now. Look, let's say, Trees of Life. A wonderful work of Chiva Lubeski, one of the finest cinematographers, but his work on only part of this. Yeah, yeah. The rest of this like dinosaurs, which, and explosions and everything else, which is, has, uh, I wrote an article about it, uh, which is extremely important for the whole fabric of the film. Yeah. But it is not your film. Hugo, Avatar. Yeah. Everything else. So, also we're teaching in our school virtual cinematography, which is when you yeah. use virtual camera with virtual... And Avatar up. received, uh, was nominated for... He, um, no, um, DP um, received Oscar. It was a lot of d debates about it because uh, people has equally reasonable argument on, on, on both sides. Yeah. Okay, and uh, well, they have to give to somebody. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> somebody yeah, yeah. is responsible because yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so today is DP in charge. It's no institution. Because like, uh, one of the things what we're doing in our school, we're preparing our people to be director of imaging. Yeah. Okay. So well, what lies behind the desire to take back that uh, control? What do you What do you think is the issue? Because in the thirties, say. The director would maybe direct the actors, and the director of photography would place the camera in relation to the art department making the uh, mm -hmm. storyboard. So yeah. there was a compartmentalized construction of how the images were controlled, yeah? And now, with uh, digital practice, mm -hmm. there is a tendency towards compartmentalization. But you're actually arguing for an overall view. Well, well the, the, the main argument, and again, Again, I, I start talking about Wilmers and how we became co-founders. Co yeah. And because he, we, he also noticed it in his seminars in Budapest, that uh, a lot of things happening. Because when you meet all the time with young new people, you hear a, 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 a lot of stuff. So when, we, when I took his interview, which uh, then after this we start talking about general things, I told him we have an idea, so I'd like to join you. And we start to be, became co-founders co when classical and virtual cinematography all, all together. And it was our mutual desire, desire of people to keep cinematography as, as profession as long as possible. I would, I would like to say forever, it's, but not, nothing forever is happening. But because otherwise profession will disappear. Like, like where is IBM Selectric uh, technicians now? Or like CNN recently fired all still photographers. Everybody is photographer now. Yeah. It's a big deal. I take my camera and photographer. I produce a picture. Yeah, I, I, meet, I meet people that are 20 years old and they say I'm a, I'm a director of photography. Great, right? wonderful. It, it is great, but I wonder, because the issue around it, like, you know, if, 
If I say I'm an artist, the truth is that the world needs to also see that. I can't just be an artist. Okay, I... everybody can be director of photography who, who cannot prove opposite. <laughs> it's very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what kind of director of photography is uh, because you, are you a shooter or yeah. a director of photography? Because people have uh, very foggy ideas what director of photography does. Yeah. It's not it's not guy in a silk s scarf and nice uh, jacket yeah, looking yeah. in the camera. Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. How, how did the, okay? Here's a crucial issue on some levels. Yeah. Which is the issue of the digital? Because I said to you, I mentioned to you before we began to talk about that how, how might the digital cinematography have affected cinematography. And you quite rightly said to me, no, the issue is cinematography. But where does, where does the digital sit within image making? In well, it's uh, just another progressive tool yeah. of, of, of expression. It's, it's expressed things very differently. Yeah. Because it just happens this way, digital tools became part of everyday life of in cinematography, in photography, and art in general. It has its own way of, in their own way of expression. They allow to show things which have not been seen before. With this high speed, like, uh, like uh, with, with 3000 ASA, you can see very different. And the important part, it changed aesthetic of the, of the images. Well, it's, I believe it's a progressive step, obviously, because film as a tool, yes, it mainly associates with so-called classical period of cinematography, which is in parallel going in classical period in art, because film, camera art, cinematography art is basically borrowing things from classical painting. Just a few days ago, I've seen uh, on a big screen Barry Lyndon. I seen with my students, and we had we will have a conversation about it. But they more they were young, from 22 to 35 students. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how to put this because for them it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful, but it's irrelevant. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, and but from other from history of art and cinematography or film, it is probably the highest point of uh, when film looked like a painting. Basically, it's it's baroque film. Nothing else. It's Do you think the East European um, aesthetic is the kind of a qualitative, uh, like when you're cooking? Yeah. So you have the whole thing of cinematography, but the East European input is that the general is that fundamentally an aesthetic an aesthetic grasp because it, it's very noticeable. That I East would European say is like this: uh, it's not Eastern European is European. Eastern European uh, aesthetic has its own flavor. Yeah. Well, it was more paprika or something, <laughs> or pepper. But again, here is a fun fundamental difference. Yeah. Uh, fundamental difference is uh, in Europe, film art or cinema in general, uh, been created mainly as a form of art. Okay. The United States is a form of commerce. Okay. Obviously, not all European films are art. In it's very interesting that American directors want. Uh, East European cinematographers in a lot of cases. Oh, it is a very long issue. I believe I spoke about it many times because uh, basically a lot of people ask me, like I remember my first agent or second agent gave me a t-shirt, what is a Hollywood cinematographer? First of all, he's smiling because he doesn't know English all the time. He's, you can pronounce his name. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff, I still have it somewhere. Well, it all started from um, Newquist in '76, when he was by various complex negotiations and court and was allowed to shoot film in the United States. Then it became uh, influx because again, it's coming to the same point. It's coming to the same point. In Europe, again, as I said before, cinematography in particular and film and cinema, it's a form of art. Here's in form of industry and cameras again, crossover. But we all been taught to be artists, first and foremost, with excellent knowledge of technology. Otherwise, you know, if your painter doesn't know what paint is, uh, your brush is, you're not a painter, you can't do it. You can do it very badly. Same way, if you'd like to really achieve something, you have to know, learn technology, but you artist. With incredible knowledge of technology, you have to know technology more than technicians. Okay, this, is this, this is a concept, but your art is first, first and foremost. We've seen an interesting period where film-based cinematographers, uh, maybe 
10 years ago with the advent of the beginnings of digital cinematography would take on DITs or whatever you call them here, digital imaging technicians, yeah. whatever, um, who are fundamentally, it seemed to me, coming from the, the video world, to yeah. make available an easy pathway into the digital. And it seems like now we're coming to the point where most film cinematographers have got their heads around how this stuff kind of works. It, it's not so difficult. No. If, if you know basic of film, if you know basic of imagery making, it's not so difficult. Well, different latitude, sure. Okay, but it's what's the matter, what is the director of photography with experience is different from different of a director of photography, so-called 19 years old, who is doing like P. Okay, I shoot everything. You know, it's totally different. So yeah. it's no big deal to figure out latitude. Well, sure. It was, it was a time when uh, stack was 20 PSA, so. And now the time stack is uh, d digital stack uh, three three thousand they say so you, you are as professional you are adjusting your thinking about it your your do you, your do you think that a cinematographer a DP director of photography should know as much as the digital imaging technician about the color matrices inside a camera or is there a le where's the line that a, a the line is inside of cinematographer. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, I don't know, because the people learning differently, people apply to practical life their knowledge di differently, and uh, like, I remember I spoke with a very good cinematographer, very good friend of mine, <laughs> I told him, we've been talking, he said, you know, my best color correction system is a box of good whiskey to my colorist. I will tell him what to do, and he does, and I, I have no time to be involved. And I know cinematographers, no less talented and quality, who go inside and asking questions which sometimes engineers can't answer. It's, it depends on in individual, the result counts. Would you, would you, um, I'd like you to think about something. Just go ahead. Um, when um, you introduce a light in the virtual space, you can introduce a light, if you like, very low level, just here. It's an invisible thing. Now, in, in the real world, you can't introduce a light just here because you'd see the light. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'm wondering about the practice in virtual cinematography, which enables you to place, you know, you know your theory, you can place the thing anywhere you like. Yeah. But there's something about when you're in the live set, one of the biggest uh, issues is how to get that light in that place so that the camera can't see it, but does exactly the right thing in exactly the right way. And there's something about the difficulty of that that's a very interesting thing for the cinematographer and the, for the grip and for the, the electricians. Do you, do you see what I'm trying to get at here? Okay, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you asking what is motivate you, what you have to possess, or what is influencing you in setting light? Give me that what is basically you're asking what what your decision based on when you're setting light? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Right? It doesn't matter. It is a, it is a virtual cinematography or live cinematography. Okay, but there's a there's an interesting thing, isn't there? Because there's classical theory. I mean, take a theory, take the American system of justified light. You know, where we, you know, here's a window. The light comes from that direction if we add light. Well, it's not American system because the system of justified light came from Germany, from German theater. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, where most of German cinematographers came from. Okay. They brought ideas of the lighting. Yeah. They all the lighting des designers in the theater of Pixar, and then some of them became cinematographers. Then some of them, and obviously it was... Uh, okay. Okay. They, they, they've been pro proponents of... Re um, realistic light, but it's not only one theory. Light, uh, justification of light, it's a it's, it's big issue. <laughs> okay, no, it's a really big issue. I think I've got a better idea of the question. I was trying to find a way to ask the question. The question is, is really is that in the theoretical uh, world of the virtual, because you can place anything anywhere, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. When you're on a, a live set, sometimes you just can't. So you have to find an interesting, you have to break the rule. Correct. To make the rule, mm -hmm. and um, there's is there in the virtual okay is there in the virtual world? Do you think something that's the same as the problem 
within the real world that produces innovative gestures? Okay. For for okay, for sake of argument, to make it simple, let's not make for now differentiation between the virtual world and live world. It would be easy. Because otherwise, we st let's start from a more general picture. Okay. The question is, okay, first of all, light must be interesting. Okay. Some people say it has been motivated. It's all big word. Motivated by what? You can have very boring, because as Ma Malier said, all genres are good except bo boring one. Number one. Second. Uh, second is, uh, I remember one of my teachers, uh, Galamnia, I remember him, uh, like, he was head of our, like, Pudovkin cinematographer, like, classic. He said, the, you, you have to, two requirements for two cinematographers. He has to make picture in focus and interesting. So, interesting is a keyword. Keyword, yeah. Keyword, okay. Uh, in this case, you may have motivational boring light. It will be motivational boring light. You have to great... Uh, Non-motivational non light, it will be interesting. There's a famous argument. You, you remember scene from, uh, I'm sure, uh, from the Bergman Fisher film called Seven Seal, when knight and devil playing chess. Okay? I remember where I read this, but it was somebody mentioned somewhere. I have to find where I read because this light is not motivation. It's, it's like two crossing back something like this. It's light is not motivational. It's not motivated light. Well, situation is also not very typical. You not very often see night and death playing chess. So it was kind of what's the motivation? There was a lot of argument was uh, with uh, when Gordon Willis Coppola's film God, Godfather came out. And Gordon Willis got a lot of, uh, well, let's say nicely, arguments. I call it differently, but not now. <laughs> why, he, if he's really able cinematographer, why he does not have spots in his eyes? It means almost it disqualified him. He is not cinematographer, which was a really stupid argument, totally. But anyway, it was argument was done and expressed very, very forcefully. Okay. Well, yes, in real life, you have, uh, yes, you have some um, light re reflection, classical, classical, st standard classical theory, a practice you have to, if you don't have, I remember when I was start to make fa photographs for one of the first class, you have to have small light, small, not affecting exposure, small light, but you have to c c create a, then you're professional, if not, you're nothing. <laughs> well, he argued for, as an artist, well, he'd like to, his absence of light in the eyes is, is the artistic symbol. Oh, what it was not taken very easily. Yeah. So it's the same. Well, do we have to have uh, glimmer in the eyes? It's, it's motivated, but it would be wrong against artistic uh, approach. So, to answer you, your question, motivation is a very big word, and sometimes it works, sometimes it's not, and, uh, uh, and, but everything depends from interpretation what my, my motivation is like simplistic motivation or artistic motivation. Yeah. When doing if for and where to place light or how to light it, it depends from knowledge if you know what, what light will do. Yeah, yeah. And to know effect of the light, effect of the side light, back light, whatever, any yeah. effect of the light and how this light will help to illustrate the story which you hired to illustrate. Yeah, and there's no, I mean, would you argue, I mean, I've got lots of questions going around my head for it, because I'm thinking of Connie Hall, and yeah. uh, the, the Gordon Willis argument is about the death of the soul, I think, in the, in the darkness of the eyes. Yes. And uh, Connie Hall's work around the overexposure of the image uh, in the early days, you know, to, if you can overexpose it, really overexpose it, don't mess around. You know, yeah. six stops over and all that stuff. And then on the other side of the game, so that's the, that, in a way, that's the American kind of uh, sensibility at its best. I wouldn't say it's American sensibility because, again, uh, I would say, I would say, um, well, there is, I would say, traditional approach 
or by book approach and innovative approach. Yeah. When I mentioned Gordon Wilson, Gordon Hall, they've been artists. Okay. And artists has a right to break, break rules, like uh, Greg Tolland wrote in 1941, yeah. famous yeah. article, How I Broke All the Rules. All right, okay, I must, I must, I haven't missed that one. I'll oh yeah, it. How I Broke All the Rules in Citizen Kane. Well, he broke all the rules. Yeah. And this is uh, arguably one of the most significant articles about art of cinematography. I, mean, I was thinking about this arc of uh, innovation with Comrade Hall and Gordon Willis and Vittorio Storaro who's got this kind of system which is wonderfully uh, poetic. Um, it's, I would say it's innovation, it's artistic approach. Sometimes artistic approach became innovative, sometimes not, but it's an uh, artistic approach to the imagery, to the way you are illustrating your script. Okay, it is, um, some of them became innovative. Like, for example, a very famous scene in Barry Lyndon with scandals. Everybody like to talk about this scene. Wonderful. I've seen it again and again and again. I've seen this, uh, and I believe I spoke in my class about it. It, w it is more innovative from point of view of technology yeah. than from point of art. Because what's happened, first of all, it's, it's like, okay, if you put camera at night, proper exposure, have gray overcast. It's what how nights look like. When artists light nights, they put a lot of contrast. Impression of the night would be totally different. It was great technical achievement by many people, and Kubrick and uh, the Julio, everybody who found, found the sixth family with the lens, able to make it work. But what they did, they basically, it's basically kind of flattish image. And even if uh, Kubrick always said uh, Georges de la Tour and his famous painting was inspiration, but if you look at Georges de la Tour side by side, they inspired him for sure. But it's not exactly the same image because in George Del Tour, like, like Saint Matthew painting, is like high contrast, which in our mind associated with candlelight. When they put like 0 0.7, 0 0.7 f stop and shut everything, how it is? Look, it's very flat because this make they put put air at last. So what what I'm saying, it is technical innovation because today everybody can do with they have like speed like 100 SA. So you have to put a lot of lights and everything. So it, today you can do scene exactly the same with any video camera, with iPhone. Mm -hmm. Trickery is how to make the scene feel like a candlelight. Just do not reproduce only the candlelight. So this, this kind of leads me, I mean, this is right where I need to be really in the yeah. question. Because the, so here we are with digital cinematography, um, which is an electronic way of, you know, doing what photochemical work did before. Are we at the place, I mean, just going back to Connie Hall with overexposure, I mean, one of the issues around top level, ex highest level exposure on a digital camera is sometimes they're going to yellow or going to pink. Do you think we are now getting close to the place where there is a, an aesthetic pleasure in overexposure in digital cinematography? Or are we still not there? Well, okay, he did our exposure not because he didn't know how to expose. He liked to make different images which can express something which would be not, not able to express by normal exposure. It's his artistic choice and definitely when you hitting like five, five stops or and printing in light hundred, it's a totally different image. And maybe he is looking for this abnormality of over to make normal image from horribly overexposed negative, which need to be printed on light 65, whatever. It's his artistic choice. So, and uh, I, I'm sure there is a somebody already, or will be soon, who decide to do similar things with uh, digital, but again, there's a big, big, big difference between film and digital. In digital, you would like to avoid uh, overexposure because nothing there. Boom! Yeah. You, you can do four stop under exposure, still, you still have something. In film, it's very different. If you, if you have no, if you have under exposure, it, it's nothing there. But if you have overexposure, you have something to 
play with. I believe uh, there's a more room for experimentation, artistic experimentation, when in digital you do underexposure. You mm. start to see a lot. By physical nature of the sensor, if you're overexposed, you have nothing to mm. recover. Mm. And why what digital did for everybody had been able to show nights as never seen before. It's very easy to show at night now. It's very easy because you just can't imagine them. All dark areas, in any stage, you don't need light because you can, there's a noise, there's a balance between technical quality, artistic quality, for sure. But what digital cinematography does, uh, with, you, you're going into territory which was never, never available to many people to go in dark night without special lighting. What, what do you feel about the, uh, the tendency over the last five years to protect data under any circumstance, even if the protection of data was compromised the artistry. How protection of data compromise? I don't understand. Um, in in the in the last days of the analog video, yeah, it, it struck me that one of the things we had to do to achieve uh, innovation was to corrupt, corrupt yeah. the image in in the shooting stage, so that when we retrieved the uh, the image again in post production, that we made changes that could have bring us to places that we couldn't get to if we'd have protected the image strongly at the beginning. In other words, if you oversaturated or if you, uh, I don't know, if, if any, any kind of uh, process that would be regarded as bad shooting, when you went to post-production to recome back to the, for instance, taking a red, highly, so going with the art department yeah. and making highly, uh, Prominent Sa saturated reds. Saturated reds. Yeah. So that when you desaturate, you know, which would look terrible if you just treated it normally. But in post production, because you pulled everything back, the red sat at the normal level and the rest of the shot was diluted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the contemporary situation, we would protect the data uh, by not over overexposing or oversaturating or over anything. We would all, in all situations, we would protect it and, and believe, have faith in raw, so that we could do what we wanted as a post-production gloss of the image. I can always tell when there's a look being put on the image at the back end. Well, when you're shooting raw, okay, normal logic would be to protect everything what you exposed. And then you can do whatever you want or, 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 or do nothing or whatever. You have to protect you have to have full range of options in your raw. Okay. Then, then depends from what you or your associates like to do with it. It's, it's the same as a, as a negative. But in, it, it, in it was a mantra. You have to have good, healthy negative. Able to print. Ah, uh, yeah, but hold on. Let me just challenge you. Let me challenge you a tiny bit. Please. Like, if you, uh, in, I don't know, 1960, and you've got 50 ASA, whatever they are. Whatever. And you overexpose it by two stops, so you can work with it in 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 post. You would actually not protect the data at all. In fact, you would corrupt the data, not data, but corrupt the. Yeah, if, if you're overexposed to it, it will be impossible to print. It would consider te technical default. Yet yeah, you take something like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, say, and uh, uh, it's it's Gordon Willis, isn't it? No, it was no, uh, it was Conor Hall. Sorry, good. Okay. So people, what I'm, all right, all I'm really trying to ask is there was a moment in film history where the negative was not being protected, the big fat negative was not being protected by the innovators because they knew that if they pushed it or pulled it in a hard way, they could get a, a result that was different from the majority of cinematography. Well, normally 99% negative is supposed to be normal, able to be printed and equivalent of 25 across or whatever level it is. Yeah. Some people, due to their influence, artistic authority, were able to make experiment, like on Hall, and again, some, and you know, there is a known case when he horribly or exposed one TV series and like um, was described in one of the articles, and well, he was supposed to do inter-negative, inter-positive, and recover everything. And um, or it was, and so they have to do it with acknowledgement that it is done for special reason, not a technical mistake. 
like uh, like Wilmersh and McKevin Mr. Smith, they flash negative one of the first United States and one of the greatest sample of impressionistic style of the movies. Again, studio was against it, Alton was for it, and uh, they ex been extremely aggressive toward to Wilmersh. Was, was going to fire him or fire everybody and yeah, uh, because yeah, well, the cinematographer. Oh yeah, sure. No, it's it's normal. Hey, blame. But because but it was done, it was explained to them that it was done for artistic reasons. And sometimes in seventies you can in this short period of time in Hollywood in seventies you can argue a lot with people like um, Alton. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so but it was done consciously. It was done for effect. It was yeah. done not because people didn't know what to do with it. Yeah, it was it was done for effect. But normal normal mantra was pra get good healthy negative, which can be printed twenty five across, and then you can do what whatever you want, optically or otherwise, or like through IP, IN. Okay. okay. So logic saying you have to create enough foundation to do whatever you want later, because you can think I'd like to make this scene in yellow. Later, it could be seen maybe in the blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, it all depends from many circumstances how strong you're feeling about ye yellow. And I remember one producer told the story just uh, she produced some film in Japan, uh, American film in Japan, and they'd like to put g green filter in front of it because they feel as a green. And she said, J These people, no. Why? It's our artistic choice. Well, Yes, we can, if we decide still to do it when film will be over, we'll set green filter. But now we don't know. It could be very different. We can't lock ourselves in green filter image. The baked in look. Huh? The baked in look. Yeah. Yeah. Again, there's a, especially such a strong one, green filter. You can, you can get, get out. So obviously, it's coming back to the issue of if you designer of the images, you director of imaging, you basically know what's going, you've been able to influence outcome. If you uh, prove to be knowledgeable and reasonable, you can do a lot of things. Mm. Okay. Okay. Like, like I remember I went many years ago to see my dailies in one of the labs and see fiber and I came like, you know, and people still looking at somebody else's dailies and I just w walked in and in the middle of like scream, it was awfully under exposure negative. And young cinematographer said, it's my vision. It's nothing to see, it's my vision. Obviously he was replaced a couple of days later. <laughs> but you know, if, uh, if it's your vision based on conscious, reasonably decision, or just you covering with these words inability to do anything significant. <laughs> yeah, because to yeah, see yeah. to to see print printed on light eight, which you have grain the size and cinematograph say is my vision. No, it's not your vision. It's under exposure. <laughs> Okay, Sorry. let me take you one. No, I got you. Let me <laughs> take you one further. I'm trying to. Um, I'm testing boundaries. Okay. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, it's good. This place is very good to test boundaries. <laughs> well, I was hoping that would be the case. Okay, so back to Comrade Hall. Um, just before he died, maybe a little earlier, he was talking about how the photograph, a photographic grasp of cinematography, mm -hmm. um, that in a shot, in any shot. Every frame, every frame should be of photographic quality. So even if you pan through dead space between two characters, yeah. even in that space in between, there should be of photographic quality. How do you how do you feel about that in relation to? Well, it is Conrad Hall aesthetics. He is uh, Conrad Hall is a product of his own time, uh, and um, he started working in the 50s, 60s. Work seven is up to where he's one of the great samples of people working very late and cinematographer profession allowed. So he is a great representative of cl classical aesthetic tendencies when high quality image, being a standard of high quality image, is supposed to be uh, created by, by Kodak in the 1930s, what good quality image is by British scientist Mies. He created like what is good image supposed to look like? It has to be full range. It has to be this element of black, this amount of the line. Basically, he wrote like recipe. What image is supposed to look like? 
fine, done deal. So, and Conor Hall was absolutely like follower, proponent of the classical photographic tendency, what image is supposed to be photographically perfect everywhere. Well, fast forward. It was 60s, 70s, based on certain a aesthetics. I can tell you just um, uh, today's aesthetics is very different because people who today cinematographers, they haven't got his first impression of the images going in the movie theater and see Citizen Kane, no. or even Lawrence Arabian, no. The first experience, what image was supposed to look like, is a bad DVD taken from, oh no, DVD, VHS, DVD. Bad VHS taken from public library, generation number six, copied and copied by their parents. And they, I spoke with many students. They thought it's how image was supposed to look like. Gr grainy, no color, High contrast, it's what image. When I show them in uh, prints, for a thousand, probably, wow, it's how it's supposed to look like? Yeah. This is the movie how it's supposed to look like. So aesthetics change. So it was absolutely right for Conrad Hall to say so because it's reflect his aesthetic. Okay. So, and images, it was so-called reproductive period of cinematography when people basically make the judgment about quality of the image based on classical photography and classical painting, oil, oil, oil period mainly, not, not impressionism. <laughs> oil, oil. So it was aesthetics, it was aesthetic of time. Today, aesthetics based on mainly uh, uh, music videos, video games now, and uh, fashion photography, it's different kind of a aesthetics which is more in sync with today's new generation of cinematographers. Okay. It's what exactly happened when I saw these people a few days ago, uh, Barry Linden. Yeah. It's beautiful, but it's remotely beautiful. Okay. It has no association. So it was absolutely right for him to say it, but again, if you're talking about cinematography as an art, aesthetical norms and aesthetical perception changing. He said probably in the 80s, today is uh, 40 years later or 30 years okay, later. Okay, so to, to, bring, to tie this all together, bring all this, all of that, yeah. into one place and to, to conclude. Given today's aesthetic, the begin or, or what this seems to be the aesthetic of today, how, how's it going for the Global Cinematography Institute? How, how is your visualization of what should be coming to pass? How's it working out with the, the classes that are being taught and the students that are coming to it? How, how's it feeling at this moment in time in relation to everything we've talked about? Well. Uh, okay, it's kind of like this. Uh, we are not catching fish for student, but we're providing them all tools how to catch the fish. We're suggesting them different recipes how to prepare the fish and how to eat it later if you want. Okay, we give them knowledge of we give them knowledge of uh, how to say how to sense cinematography very wide, how to able to meet any challenges. For example, now we're all in decorative style with a lot of special effects. Yeah, it'll pass soon. As you know, artistic tendencies, like a fashion, I've said, changing every th 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 30 years. Well, now it's kind of not so much attention to the precise lighting, it's normally. Till time soon when we have more attention to, to precise lighting, not exact copy of lighting be, before. But you know how many years you can see pictures without much lighting. Tastes will change. Like you have like white tie and you have narrow tie. See, it changes all the time. <laughs> and the perception of visuals will say, so we are preparing our students to meet any challenge based on learning of the technology and based on learning on aesthetics, like basic arts, law of art. All new, well forgotten old, nothing new, okay? So people may say Dogma 95, oh, hey, it was that before. It was, that's starting from Ziga Vertov, new, new wave. It was happening every uh, few years, yeah. We don't like any artificial things. Fine. Okay. Now we like we may 
now we can be, how we can be less artificial things now with avatar, it's all artificial things. It will go, it's not like, it's like a coil. It's coming, but a different level. It's not the same, because there's vertical, but it's, it's like a coil, it's going same change of the styles, de de decorative, ornamental, constructive. Again, decorative, ornamental, constructive, like all art, all visual art. It's the same cycles from ancient Greece, but it's always slightly different because of different angles, different vertical. So we can predict maybe trends, but we don't know what's happened tomorrow because we can figure out what happened in the most unpredictable part and what's in the brain of artist. He may invent something which we could never, never imagined. And this will be new things. 